Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you all. As we are turning to our scripture lesson for this day, would you join me in prayer? Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us eyes that are ready to recognize your presence in our midst and our neighbors in places that we least expect them. And then give us hearts that are willing to serve any and all who you call us to love. And now may the words of our mouths and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we are continuing on in our summer sermon series in this case. This morning we are picking up in the book of Genesis, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. So listen now for God's word for us this day. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out into the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? Cain said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer of the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite stories about children's time. A pastor is leading her younglings one Sunday morning, and as they gathered up at the front of the church, she asks them, what they want to be when they grow up. One says, a doctor. Another says, an astronaut. A little girl, of course, says, a princess. And then one little boy raises his hand really high in the air, ooh, ooh, me, me, and says, I want to be a pastor like you. To which one of the little girls promptly pipes up, you can't be a pastor, you're a boy. Oh, how many things we tell one another that we cannot or must not do. This morning, we are moving on to the second generation of Genesis. For the past two weeks, we have been studying what happened at the very beginning of creation, whether in the universal or much more immediate sense of the Garden of Eden. 
And while we are skipping over the great fall from grace that occurs in Genesis 3, because we covered it during Lent, we should keep the actions of our primordial parents in the backs of our minds. Remember, after the first man, the word for him being ha-adam, dust or earth or dirt, is formed and life is breathed into him by God, and after he is given his true partner in life, as God forms and fashions this new creature from his very rib, the flesh and bone, isha, or woman, because she is taken from man, or ish. Have fun with that one, ladies. After God has formed this first family unit and placed them in a garden filled with every fruit tree imaginable, God gives them just one commandment. Do not eat from this one tree over here that will give you all of the knowledge that you need to learn all at once. You're not ready for it. But of course, along comes the serpent with legs who says, God's not actually going to kill you. You deserve to be all knowing of the stuff and all the things. You deserve to be like God. Just do it. You'll be fine. Just take the pomegranate and eat. Remember, apples didn't exist in the Near East. And the word for apple is almost identical to the word for evil in Latin. It wasn't an apple. That was just the Catholic Church having fun with word puns. So Adam and Eve, they take the fruit and eat. They realize all the knowledge they were meant to learn over time all at once. And because they were literally born yesterday, it overwhelms them. And they realize they're naked and they freak out and they cover themselves. In God's punishments, they interestingly continue to explain the way the world is, the way husbands have loved to lord it over their wives throughout history, the way women go through tons of pain in childbirth, the way humans generally hate snakes, and oh, no more easy food. Now you got to work for it. But life goes on. Which brings us to our story for today. The man, Ha-Adam, knows his wife Eve, biblical language for fun stuff, who he finally gives a name at the end of Genesis 3 that means mother of all the living things. And she gives birth to their firstborn son with God's help. They name this boy Cain. Shockingly, they soon have a second son, and they name him Abel. The boys grow up. One becomes a planter, the other becomes a shepherd. The ancient forms of farming that existed from the get-go of civilization and likely had a healthy rivalry. Continuing that whole thing of the Bible explaining the way things are. And life goes on beyond the gates of Eden. The boys, they bring their offerings to God. It's the same word. Both are bringing the first fruits of their work and therefore should be equal in God's eyes. But something goes wrong. Only Abel's offering from his flock is deemed worthy. And like all children, when a parent shows love and pride in only one child, Cain gets frustrated, upset, angry, and he takes his brother out back and kills him. That escalated quickly. The author, he doesn't really explain why God didn't accept Cain's offering, and scholars have been debating why ever since, which is thousands of years. However, the ongoing saga and story may suggest what happened. After Abel is buried... God comes to Cain, and like every good parent, asks, like God doesn't know, where's your brother? Uh, I I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Probably that one line in the story that always sticks in my head and my heart. 
And God responds, what have you done, child? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the soil. One of my all-time favorite movies is Remember the Titans. It is based on a true story when the city of Alexandria, Virginia, finally consolidated its three public high schools into one called T.C. Williams, which meant that the football teams had to combine as well. Early on in the movie, the players are taken to camp for two weeks at a college in Pennsylvania where the black and white students almost entirely intentionally ignore one another until their head coach, Herman Boone, forces interactions between the players under penalties of three-a-day practices, which if you've ever done sports in summer heat is not something you want to do. Seeing that even this was not working, he wakes them all up in the middle of the night for a run through the woods. And after running for quite some time, they finally stop. And they find themselves standing in a graveyard on the edge of Gettysburg Battlefield. Boone tells them that they should take a lesson from the dead. The ground on which they are standing is soaked in the blood of brothers, young men who were fighting the same fight that we are still fighting among ourselves. Who counts? Who matters? Who has value? When God banishes Cain, it's not just from a garden, it's from the very community of support and love that he has always known. From his family and God's own presence that still resides among them. And Cain, and Cain cries out, my iniquity is too much for me to bear. It's not my punishment as our translation renders it, but my sin, my transgression, the harm I have done is literally what the Hebrew says. Cain repents, says I'm sorry, has a change of heart, and God listens. God says that anyone who kills Cain will be treated with sevenfold vengeance. And Cain goes to the land of Nod, east of Eden, and builds the first city of refuge for those who are guilty of crime but need safety. Like those other cities that will be set up by the Deuterocanonical Code later on. Because God would always rather show mercy and see us learn and watch our hearts and lives grow. So back to T.C. Williams. That team, it did come together despite all the odds that were stacked against it. And at the center of the story were these two young men with skin of different colors, who were the team's captains. Eventually, they saw the truth of who each other was through the fog of all the hate that the world had taught them. And when Gary, the white team captain, was paralyzed from the waist down in a car accident toward the end of the season, Julius, his fellow captain, comes to see him in the hospital. And as he enters the room where Gary is lying in the bed, the nurse sees him and tells him only kin is allowed. But Gary quickly quips, can't you see the family resemblance? That's my brother. Cain and Abel is one of my favorite stories to teach and especially to teach to little children, because of this one line. 
Are you your brother's keeper? Are you your sister's keeper? And who are your siblings on this planet? Because I'll tell you something. Even little children get this concept. Every other person on this planet is your sibling because God made them all. So when they get physically hurt or torn down by a bully or told that they don't matter by the world, it is each and every one of our jobs to help them back up again, to stand with them when they need it, and to fight to make sure that they have what they need. Because mercy and love are at the heart of who our God is. And it shouldn't have to take a blood-soaked ground for any of us to get that point. It should be part of who we are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.